Joe, you're doing pretty well, mate. I tell you what, this team manager's job's worse than ever driving a motor car. <laughs> Keep it up, buddy. I'll see you soon. Thank you, Wynn. Thank you, Wynn. Thank you, Alan. That Australian job was massive. You had to convince thousands of people that you didn't know that you were capable of doing it, i.e. holding dealers, um, the, the press in Australia. Yes, they knew of me, but they didn't really know the real Wim Percy. 90 was, um, it was just a hard slog all day with a bulletproof car. Um, and our strategy paid out, it paid off. They had to turn the turbos back. Not too far off the start, the rest of the field pulling up on Conrod Strait. So you have it. Klaus Niedzvit sits on pole position in the ANZ Sierra, and alongside of him is Dick Johnson, the man whose car won this race last year. Stand by Australia, stand by TV3 in New Zealand and the world. Australia's great race ready to explode from Mount Panorama Bathurst, Sunday, September 30. And tripping the line almost was one of the pole cars getting away. Peter Brock, a magnificent start up on the outside. Just watch Brocky go and Seaton will move into third spot. Longhurst, a brilliant start. Johnson, a very, very poor start. And Klaus Niedzvitz is at least through the first turn. Look at the traffic and they head up Mountain Straight for the first time. Going beneath the Corolla sign, the bridge halfway along Mountain Straight. And here they come. The jockeying for positions now. Up to the right-hander at Repco as they exit that turn and now make their way up Mountain straight towards BP Cutting. Percy going through, Crompton going through, Neatsvitz in front, Brock second, Seaton, then followed by Longhurst, then the second of the ANZ cars. George Fury, a great start, and Colin Bond just ahead of the two uh, V8 Commodores. Might be timely now to have a look at an action replay of the start of the great race. The jumble for the first turn. OK, we'll take it off race, Cameron, win Percy. Look at Brock. Johnson just stopped right in front. Percy backed it out, I think, and was also gathered in there by about six or seven cars, including his teammate, Neil Crompton. Kevin Waldock going around the outside of the playscape machine. I let it bolt down. I was happy that it was a thousand Ks. I'd done too many long distance races to worry about the beginning. You settle down, you work and you work at it. And that's what I like doing, and that's what I love doing. Long distance stints, working, thinking, analysing. And I believe that Gracie could back me up and do the same thing. Looking at Wynn Percy and the Holden dealer team, they're in eighth position at the moment as we welcome Mark Osler to the microphone. Yes, Wynn's running. I was talking to Wally Story, the team manager yesterday. He said they could consistently run about 18s or 19s in this car. I've got the put the clock on him next lap and see if they're running to their race plan. Wynn and Alan Grice very confident with this car. They say it can run it hard all day. And it's going to be interesting to see after a thousand tough kilometres around here whether this thing's up in the top five. Wynn has uh, fairly rocketed up through the field as well because as we saw on uh, uh, Dulux Auto Colour Race Cam, which we see again there at the start, he really did get swamped by the pack. So to make his way up to uh, eighth place at the moment, he's flying. Doing very well. You can see him working hard at the wheel there. Wynn had an unfortunate injury at Sandown when he tore a muscle in his left shoulder. He's been undergoing a lot of physiotherapy and treatment by the doctors here to try and get the arm back to full strength. And uh, he commented yesterday that he felt he'd be able to do the job even if it wasn't 100%. Inside of Wynn Percy's car at 280 kilometres an hour. Looks like he's had a little ding at the front of the car too, so he's had an eventful first uh, 15 laps. Well, if he's had to fight his way back up through the field, uh, in the traffic, and also with the back markers, it's very easy to just clip another car. Wynn's had a few problems, uh, an injury problem all week. Alan Grice has done most of the testing and uh, drove yesterday. Were you surprised that Percy started today? I was a little bit, but Wynn uh, Win is also the team manager of the team now. And uh, I think most of the guys sort of rallied around and said, oh, come on, Wynn, you know, you've, you've got to do it, mate. We've worked for this all year, which they have. This is the one race that the uh, the Holden race team looked to during the year that they, they know they can be successful in. Just had a good view of the front of Percy's car, and you can see he's had quite a bit of paint taken off, so... It does look uh, very much as though it's just superficial, and uh, nothing to worry about from Wynn's point of view. 
I guess as team manager, the easiest time of the race is when you're actually in the car. I would you think so, yes. You could relax and just do the job. So we're looking at Wynn Percy, Alan Grice's co-driver there in eighth position at the moment. And the race leader is Jim Richards from Klaus Niedswitz and Dick Johnson third. sixth position. He made his way past Glen Seaton. And Winston really flying. I still think with the pace that uh, that's being run at the front, this car could come good at the end. Yeah, we would have to be very happy with this performance. We're not even uh, one hour into the race. And here's the works Commodore up to sixth position. And they're going to look very strong. And only just ahead of him is Greg Hansford. when Percy has his sights set on now as he makes his way up Mounted Straight. Win Percy, car number 16. Don't discount the Holdens here today. I know it's early days and all the Sierra owners and a number of the drivers are suggesting the, uh, the Nissan is going to fall over. That's what they're hoping on. They need that to happen. Make no mistake in order to win this race today. And the other good thing is that um, Jim Richards has such a capable co-driver and young Mark Scaife who can drive the tin tops. He's at home in an open wheeler. And I think he could almost go the distance a thousand clicks by himself. Yeah, he's a very fit young man, Mark Scaife, and uh, that is just the classic example of what you have to do at Bathurst these days. It has become so professional, you can't afford to have the, the lunchtime driver who's maybe a second or so slower than the lead driver. You have to have two number ones that can get in the car and run flat out for a thousand k's. Here's Wynn Percy at speed coming along Conrod Strait, bound under the Corolla hat sign for Caltex Chase. Still staying in touch there with uh, Greg Hansford in the uh, second ANZ car. Great speed shot again, straight over the top of our track cam. One guy I have been keeping an eye on is uh, Wynn Percy. The order again for you at home. Jimmy Richards continuing to lead. Tony Longhurst runs in second. It's great to see Tony up there at least staying in touch with the leaders. Jeff Allen runs third in the second of the Johnson cars. In fourth spot, Wynn Percy, then Greg Hansford, Larry Perkins, Colin Bond, Dick Johnson, Klaus Nietzsch, George Fury, and the brat from Ballarat, Neil Crompton. So Holder looking pretty good. They really are. It's, uh, I'm surprised to see that Percy has got this far up the field. I know there have been some tyre problems for many of the Sierra runners, but uh, to be honest, I thought the car would run in about sixth place and slowly pick them off as, as the hours, hours tick by, but Wynn really is flying. He loves this circuit. Alan Jones, who's had such wretched luck in this race so far. I don't think it'll be too long before he makes it into the top 10, 13th at the moment. And we expect a pit stop shortly also from Peter Brock, yet another one for the mobile team. Not forgetting, of course, that uh, when Alan Jones brings his car in, he'll be uh, swapping over to the, the uh, Longhurst car. And the Longhurst car now is running in a very strong second position. So the B&H team are not out of this by a long shot. No, it'd be uh, very, very cruel luck for them not to uh, be around at the finish of today's race. And I tell it, I take the point that Alan Jones made earlier. And that is, if he does make it onto the, uh, the victory roster today, victory will seem that much sweeter with a few of the hurdles he's had to jump. Alan was very disappointed yesterday in qualifying. The uh, gearbox jammed in first gear halfway through his qualifying run. Jonesy was all psyched up to put the thing on uh, pole position. Must have been a great disappointment. So, as you say, Mike, it'd be sweet revenge if he could uh, pull up a win today. So, Win Percy continues. What an exciting race we've had so far.
Now the note from the pits that the Tony Mulverhill McIntyre Commodore has been disqualified from the event. We'll come back to that as Wim Percy. Percy, yep, steps out of the Telecom Mobile's V8 Commodore and puts Alan Grice behind the wheel. What's running in fourth place with the Commodore? Holly Story saying to me yesterday they should do this change without a patch change. This is just tyres, fuel and a driver change in about 30 seconds. Hands are up on this side of the car. And this is starting to take a while. That looked like a pretty good stop, Johnny Brady. They did, and uh, Wynn Percy's out of the car now trying to get his helmet off. Wynn, can you hear me? Well, we're happy with everything. With all the stupid things, I must have pressed a little bit too hard or we got something on the floor. And the the start line, the clutch stayed on the floor. So Alan and I have just got to drive the race by pressing it enough to clear, but not firmly to the floor. That's causing a bit of trouble out there then? Well, uh, it's not easy, but to be honest, it's not that difficult. It's not busy at all. It's just embarrassing to start. Was that the reason for this stop? Like you were scheduled in about four laps anyway? Oh, the clutch just wouldn't release the floor. When the Commodore's certainly going pretty well at the moment, yeah, I don't know why we've got a fuel pickup problem, so we're a little bit concerned. It's a bit early for that, but uh, we'll see. Thanks, mate. Thanks, Johnny. Alan Grice stepping into the number 16 car has rejoined the race in 11th spot, so that's not too bad. Great scrap going on here between Larry Perkins, also Wynn Percy coming up through the field, and there is the Tony Longhurst car coming out of the pits. Longhurst in the pits. Of course, was running second on the road, has rejoined, but hasn't dropped that far back, only to seventh position. And quite a very orderly pit stop, uh, too. Quite incredible stop. It was uh, somewhere around 25, 26 seconds. It really was uh, a blinder. Alan Grice, of course, up to position number nine. As we take Dunlop race cam, now we're riding actually in the front of the Alan Grice, Win Percy, Holden Commodore. Now, you can't get much closer to the track here at Mount Panorama. And it really doesn't require any commentary. The sounds and the sight of a very quick lap here in traffic. Battle continuing here between uh, Fury, the number 20 B and H car, and of course, the Holden Commodore 16 with Alan Grice at the wheel, and the Nissan has actually rejoined in 10th spot. Looks like visiting an old friend now as we take Dulux Auto Colour race cam. Alan Grice back in a Commodore and storming through the pack. Good morning, Alan. Yeah, mate, how are you? Just fine, thanks. Oh, we've got a hell of a whistle in the, uh, in the earphones there. Yes, a little bit. I was going to say you could call Telecom Mobiles. They might be able to fix it. OK, Alan, the car feels uh, pretty strong despite uh, the problems of the clutch. It sounds like we may have lost Alan there for a, a tick or so. Grice seventh on the road at the moment. Obviously, uh, in talking to drivers with race cam, you have to appreciate uh, that uh, during uh, parade laps such as this behind the pace car, the crew also would like to talk to the driver, and not just the television commentators. Yes, our two of the uh, winds update, and as Mike Raymond suggests, there's been plenty of action, and it started with Wynn Percy. The Commodores are making a very good run here at Bathurst this year. At one stage, they had three in the top ten. Larry Perkins led for a short time, and that's the first time a Commodore's led since 1986 when Alan Grice won. But uh, that was Percy, now they had a few clutch problems, Grice got into the car, here's Crompton coming in, Neil Crompton. They were up into tenth position at one stage, and he said they had plenty of grip and grunt. Here's Alan Grice latching onto the tail of the Nissan. It'll be interesting to see how they start to get the Nissan will absolutely roar away up the hill, but come over the top of the mountain, I think that's where Escape is saying he's got a, a fading front brake problem. He's had that all week. Uh, the, the, the Commodores are sensational on the brakes and turn in, and they're so good. And uh, I'm so surprised to see how hard a, a Commodore's going in here. I would never have thought that a car would do something like one minute, uh, two minutes, 14s around here. It's just unbelievable. Really. Alan Grice running in fourth position at the moment. The Holden Racing Team must be thrilled with the performance of this car so far. That's right. And I, you know, it, well, as I said, I, I wouldn't have thought that it would be capable of it. And they've got a new model coming next year. And it, uh, 
I think it puts the writing on the wall for some of the Sierras. You know, they've just about reached the end of their development and there's a new Commodore coming, so you never know. You might see a uh, Holden victory at uh, Mount Panorama, yeah. They've done some fantastic work with this car throughout the year. Uh, Percy was saying even without the track resurfacing, there would have been two seconds a lap quicker with basically the same package. So it's tremendous uh, credit to these guys to get the sort of speed out of these things. That's right. Well, 8,000 revs they've been using with this car. And, uh, well, here he is. He's, he's caught right up yeah. again now. Um, although there is a slow car, Murray Carter or Matt Wacker, who is in the in front of them. But, um, 8,000 revs for a push rod V8 is just sensational. You know, and, uh, to be able to try and do it for 1,000 k's is unbelievable. You see, Grice has got a, uh, a straight cut gearbox as well with the crashing and banging going on in it. Got some other problems too, uh, guys, for the number 10 car. Klaus Niedzwitz reported with a flat tyre. Looking for him around the circuit. Meanwhile, we're riding with Gricey, and look at the power of this Nissan. Gricey was right on his hammer coming out of the elbow, and the Nissan's just streaked away down Conrad. This thing has got some grunt, there's no doubt about it. If you want to race, we've got it for you. Mark Scaife in the number one Nissan GTR leads the Tui's 1000, and behind him, all the way, is Alan Grice driving the Holden Commodore, heading up the mountain. Obviously, the Nissan uh, skips away a little as they head up here, but Grice has been making great gains across the top of the mountain. Some, some wonderful spirited driving from Grice. And keep in mind, they, as signalled earlier, they have a clutch problem. They do indeed. The Nissan also has one or two brake problems. These, these two cars, the Nissan especially, everybody said no chance. They gave it no hope at all of, uh, of even running reliably at this stage. And here it is leaving, leading the race. They also said that the Commodore wouldn't be able to stay on the pace of the Sierras. And there it is in second place, less than a second behind. <laughs> Shut the gate. It's an Aussie V8. The Holden fans on top of the mountain. Decent sort of celebration up there tonight if they get home. But uh, a couple of extraordinary strengths too early here from Jim Richards coming uh, off the grid in 10th place and getting up there and getting through the field and now Mark Scape doing a similar job after the pit stop to get through again. But there's the pressure right on as they head down the hill. Great shots here, Greg, too, from our Dunlop uh, race camp right in the, uh, the front bumper of the Holden Commodore. Show you how close Grice he can get, and you'll notice the horsepower coming to play here as the exit from Forest Elbow, and watch the Nissan and straight line. Not too close, Grice. That camera costs a lot of money. They straighten out Conrad. Straight now, just look at the power of the Nissan. It's a long time since uh, a Nissan's led the great race. It's also a long time since Alan Grice has. Grice hounds him down the straight. So. Basically, at the moment, Mark Scaife in the Nissan number one car leading by about a second over Alan Grice, about 4.9 seconds then back to Jeff Allen in the second of the Dick Johnson cars. And then one second behind him is Dick Johnson himself back at the wheel of the 17 car. So it's very close, two hours, 35 minutes into the Tui's 1000, coming to you live across the Australian television network from Bathurst in New South Wales. Grice is doing a fantastic job in second place. The speed and the ground that he manages to pick up over the top of the mountain. Well, he's been in great form all week from the, the time they arrived. They've done everything right. And on race day, payday as they say, it's all coming together for them. We'll see when Percy uh, fairly shortly, would you think? Back out there yes, the I don't think it'll be yep. too long before the pit stop. But you're able to see the last lap down Conrad Strait, the way the Nissan could just run away from the Commodore, and Grice is making a lot of this up through just sheer driving ability. Not only that, also the Holden is so much more on the pace at the moment. Uh, Larry Perkins is fighting it out for third, fourth and fifth places with the two Johnson cars. A long way to go, not a sprint race, although these guys are turning it into one. 161 laps around Mount Panorama. And here's the gap. The race leader, Mark Scaife, in the Nissan four-wheel steer, number one car. You can see the ground now that Grice has pulled on the Nissan. Right up onto the tail of it again. Fantastic stuff. The Nissan, though, just awesome down this straight. Yeah, 620 horsepower. Well, what's happened here? He's pulled wide there as they went into Forest Elbow. Now, if there's no problem with the car, he'll just shoot straight past again down the straight. 
Well, all Gricey wants to do is leave this. Well, he's doing it. So the Holden Commodore comes from behind to pass the Nissan GTR for the lead. For at least 10 laps, uh, I would catch him at the top of the mountain and hound him with both sides of his mirrors all the way down the mountain until come on straight where he'd steam away again. And I did that for about 10 laps in a row. And uh, I found out only many years later, uh, he got on the phone to Fred Gibson and said, uh, I'm worried that Grice is going to have me off. And Fred said, well, let him pass. Been giving the fast cars the, uh, the wave to come through. Haven't had any major incidents. That looks like the Bagnall Francovic um, TV3 car going through. And here is Grice in the 16 car leading the race. I think everyone would be delighted in the, uh, the Holden camp at the moment. Don't start breaking out the bubbly yet, though. Still got a long way to go. But he certainly put some pressure on, didn't he, around the top of the mountain on each occasion before he managed to find a break there. And uh, what's the pressure toll just a shade? Because the, the Nissan does appear to be going along fairly sweetly. Low well, just getting away a little. There's also the chance that uh, those brake problems that everybody has been predicting just might be coming good. Ooh, very close there as I think Francovic looked to pull out and overtake the little Toyota in front of him as Grice came charging past. Just saw him in time. Coming across the top of Mount Panorama. Do you think the Holden fans won't be out of their tents now? Here they come across the top, Castrol, Skyline. Alan Grice leading the great race through Nissan Skyline now. Let's check out how they, in fact, are running on the scoreboard. Puff of smoke there as Bright Grice uh, locked up a break. Heading down to Forest Elbow. Courtesy of Caltex, our race score. Ladies and gentlemen, a Commodore leads the great race. Richardson Scape runs second. In the GTR, third is Perkins and Mazera. In another Commodore, two Commodores out of the top three. Johnson and Bauer run in fourth spot. Allen and Radisic in fifth the second of the uh, shell cars. Six is Hansford and Giudone. Seventh, Fury and Price in the second Peter Jackson car. Needs Vitz and Biela up to eighth. Crompton and Jones at ninth and another Commodore. And Seaton and Sears round off the ten. What a race we've got going here at Mount Panorama. Back in a moment. The man who uh, led the great race, Alan Grice, stepping out of the car, pit stop. Has just uh, made his way to the pits for Win Percy to take over. Very, very um, good pit stop, this. And the information we had just prior to Grice coming into the pits that Mark Scaife had reported to his crew, great stop, fantastic stop from Wim Percy. The news from Scaife was that uh, he was having difficulty chasing uh, Alan Grice because they have a brake problem. A great driving stint from Alan Grice. Let's go to Alan in the pits. Thanks very much, Mike. Alan Grice, great to see you Holton back out front there. Yeah, the car's very strong, isn't it? Mate, it, uh, it look, it's looking good. Were you, have you been quietly confident the whole week? Yes, we knew we had a very strong car and we had a strong chance. We didn't know how quickly we could run. We certainly didn't think that, you know, 15s would be on in qualifying and 18s on in the race, uh, if you'd asked us last Wednesday. But um, we haven't changed pads yet. It's on its third tank of gas. Uh, that's a very good sign. It means that our pad wear is well under control. Um, I was soldiering there a bit, uh, some of the Sierras were burning their rear tyres early in the place. So we put a harder compound on the rear. And then of course uh, a hard compound with a greasy track is a very slidey proposition. So uh, I had a handful there for a while, but we're back on the, our chosen race rubber now. And uh, you know, it's looking fine. We certainly handled the slipperiness of it well, I suppose. With the Sierras having such tyre trouble, uh, things have got to be looking good for you. How do you feel against them out there at the moment? Yeah. Well, I'm pretty surprised, um, you know, when the uh, the pace car started off again and the virtually our little race started again, I was able to um, catch and pass uh, one of Dick's cars and one of the uh, Benson Hedges' cars, and uh, that surprised me a little, but it was also very nice. It does reflect that what we've been told in the pits, that the Sierras have had to back off a little because of the race rubber. They're trying to conserve the rubber. Alan, congratulations. Thanks very much, and I hope it keeps going for you. Thank you. Oh, and problems for the number 20 car. It is very, very warm. The second of the uh, B&H Sierras. Car number 16 continues. Win Percy at the wheel of the Holden Commodore. 
and Wynn heads up uh, Mountain Straight. Maybe to talk to the Britisher, I should allow another Britisher. Richard, I think Wynn's ready to talk to us. Good afternoon, Wynn. Good afternoon, folks. I'm afraid there's an awful lot of noise on the radio, but I can hear you. Yes, it is awful. I hope it's not distracting, is it? We might catch you up in Conrod Strait, Wynn, and uh, give you a chance to get over the mountain. All right, Mike. It's probably when... Um, I don't mind the mountain. It's probably high revs that's causing the problem. When the engine sinks a little bit, you can hear... Hear what, clearly? Till wind gets on to uh, Conrod Strait. It's fairly busy there at the moment. When it's, uh, it's Richard Hay here, mate. It's going, uh, going fairly well for you at the moment. Yep, things look pretty good at the moment. Power sound. Let's check them out on our Caltex race score. You're a Holden fan. Hey, isn't that a great sight? Wynn Percy and Alan Grice lead for Holden. The great race, the two is 1,000 over Cloud Sneedsvitz and Frankie Biela. Third is the Johnson and Bauer Shell Sierra. Fourth, Alam and Radisic in the second Johnson car. Fifth, Perkins and Mazira in the Castrol Commodore. Sixth, Richards and Scaife in the Nissan GTR. Seventh is still Neil Crompton and Bradley Jones. Eighth, George Fury, Drew Price of the Peter Jackson Sierra. Ninth is 05, Peter Brock and Andy Rouse in the Mobile Sierra. And rounding out the 10 car number nine, Greg Hansford and Pierre Giudano. A lot more of the great race when we come back. Here's our race leader, Wynn Percy, the number 16 Holden Commodore, sponsored by Telecom Mobiles. I think we expect that car in the pits, probably next time around. And a pit stop also for the 18 car is not that far away. It's running six, uh, second rather to uh, the Holden at the moment. Paul Radisic will step out. Rob Gravett will step in. Again, the Dulux Auto Colour race cam from the flight deck of the V8 Commodore. Win at the wheel. That's a pretty healthy sight for Australian race fans. There's Australia's own. All the needles on the gauge is pointing in the right direction. The engine sounding strong. Hello. Oh, no. They've got the Nissan's got a problem. Richard's slowing on Conrad. All sorts of clunking and grinding and grunching going on there. And he's What's slowing this? down. He's, he's, going to, he's going to hold up the race leader when Percy coming into the pits. Just hope he doesn't stop. No, he's going to be right. He's going to get into his pit. Look, Percy. Oh, Percy. sideways. Bang, bang. Him up. Okay. So it's all happening here at Mount Panorama. Let's go down for this pit stop. Yes, thanks, Mike, and there's a lot of concern, as you can imagine. Fred Gibson, the manager of the team, wasn't sure exactly what the problem was. He was talking about tail shafts to other pit members, but this is heartbreaking for Nissan. They seem, just when they seemed out of the woods after everybody saying that they were going to have trouble, uh, it looked like they, they'd got over it, but uh, yeah, now it's hit in a big way. So, the extent of it, we don't know. I'll find out shortly. In the meantime, John Harvey at the Holden Pits. Uh, yes, thank you. This uh, is probably one of the most crucial pit stops that these guys will ever do. Uh, it's going along on schedule at the moment. Brake pads are coming out. Uh, just looking over the shoulder of the guys, I can see it there. Yeah, they're going in the new ones. It's looking pretty good. They're putting some tape on the front of the car where that damage was sustained earlier. What seems to be the problem down there, John? Right, OK. They've, they're having difficulty getting the uh, pistons back in the calipers so they can get the new pads in, which are obviously much thicker than the worn-out ones. They've just completed that. The new pads are going in. This is a disastrous stop. It's about 2 minutes 20 at the moment. But I think they're starting to look good now. They should be out of here in about another 10, 15 seconds. A disaster. Yes, it certainly is. Everything was going so well for them. That, of course, puts the Alan Radisic car, the second Johnson car, 
up in the lead. It also moves Peter Brock up. Alan Grice sits behind the wheel of the Commodore 18, of course. The second Dick Johnson's here, and the only Dick Johnson's here, is still running, is now the race leader. Grice, he's got some uh, ground to pull back on that car. OK, he's out of the pits in two minutes, 50 seconds. Lost almost three minutes in that stop, and that is pretty well a lap and a half. In fact, we will take our race cam, Gillux Auto Colour race cam, which is sitting in the front of the... Uh, the Alan Grice Wynn Percy Commodore. Gee, it is tied up there. It looks like the, the Mobile Sierra. The 05 car. That was trailing them. Whoops, here we go, down through the dipper. So, Grice is able to get through there. Coming up on a, a bunch of uh, Ford Sierras here as they go to the dipper. One of the cars there by the look of it, uh, the Ray Lintot Gary Rush car. The the Robbie Francovic car just ahead of him. And Larry Perkins, of course, car number 11. Well, this is the battle for second and third. The two Commodores, Larry chasing the works. Works team Commodore up the hill. We'll get a split on them next time around, but this really is the race of the race. The two Commodores going head to head. And there's the 12 car going through. Rossi heading up to the top of the mountain. To the left-hander at BP Cutting. Percy Grice car going uh, through two weeks' turn. And they've had a, a great dice with uh, with Larry Perkins throughout this race. On lap 135 of 161, the pace car on the circuit at the moment. Due to that uh, accident at Forest Elbow where Barry Graham slammed into the uh, concrete retaining wall up there. So, the field tightens up behind the pace car. According to our race score, car number 11. Larry Perkins, Thomas Mazira at the wheel at the moment, leading. Over the uh, Jeff Allen, Paul Radisich car, Radisich behind the wheel of 18. And of course, uh, the Wynn Percy, Alan Grice, number 16 car. Fourth on the road, Peter Brock. He may have missed out just a little in this uh, twin pace car shuffle, Richard. Yeah, he may well have done, but uh, where the race has really gained is that on the second pace car, which is just on its way uh, over the top of the mountain at the moment, the lead cars will all have closed up. By the end of this lap, they should all be running in single file. And we should find that Larry Perkins' car, which at the moment is uh, still being driven by Thomas Mazzaro, and he's still got a pit stop to go, should be closed up on by the 18 car with Paul Radisic at the wheel. And number 16, the Wynn Percy, Alan Grice Holden, with Grice here at the wheel at the moment. So, Mike, what's the feeling up there? Uh, Neil seems to think that this car, 16, might have the edge at the moment. What do you and the boys think up at the top? Oh, hard one to call, but, uh, you know, it's hard to look past the, uh, the uh, Holdens today. They're running so well. That's without putting, uh, uh, taking anything away from the great job that the number 18 Dick Johnson car has done. But uh, when we resume racing here, It'll be the 16 car to lead away the 18 car, 11 in third, 5 in fourth, and 7 in fifth. John Harvey, a view? Uh, win. Your car is looking uh, like you could win the race. Well, it depends on this POM here with the uh, second Dick Johnson car. I mean, although they're behind us on the road now, we're behind the same pace car. Uh, we're a little bit concerned as to whether we can go to the finish on the fuel we've got. It really is going to be the very last lap, so... OK, Wynn, uh, do you have intermediate tyres or wet tyres uh, ready? Oh, yeah, for sure they're ready, but um, all the cars now are on slicks. The second Dick Johnson car went on ungrooved slicks, and uh, under that pace car situation, they were fortunate enough to come in, put the proper slicks back on, and just get back out. Jeff, do you think you can get up? Yeah, sure. Um, the car's running very, very strong. Everything's really good in the car. Paul's doing a good job. There's a straight fight to the finish now. It's a similar situation uh, as last year with uh, Wynn and me, a bit further back for seventh and eighth. It's going to be a good fight. He got the better last year. Hopefully we can get it this year. OK, well, it's going to be great television. Good luck, both of you. Thanks, John. You're not wrong, John. Thanks very much for that interview. Jeff Allen and Wynn Percy. There is the race leading car, number 16. And Mike, we have a report that it's bucketing down about five k's out of Bathurst and could be heading our way. So the, the dice hasn't, the last dice hasn't been rolled just yet. No, it certainly hasn't been. Now some have opted for slicks.
Now Johnson's car has come in, they've gone to slicks on the Johnson car. Well that was their bit of luck, being able to do that while the pace car was out and not lose any time. The good luck uh, could well come for Percy and Grice. If it does rain and they do both have to come in for tyres, both the uh, 16 and the 18 car, they could be able to just splash those extra few litres of fuel in and uh, save the day there and not cost themselves any extra time. Absolutely. Here's Grice, uh, the wheel of the hole, and just putting a bit of heat into the tyres. He, he knows the, uh, the start's imminent. Of course, we can see a few drops of rain on the windscreen of the car too, so he's got something that, else to deal with. And dark storm clouds on the horizon. Gives you a sort of feeling of deja vu, doesn't it? We've been here before somewhere. We certainly have been. Here we come through Forest Elbow. Back onto Conrod Strait. I don't think we're too far off the start. I just wonder whether uh, Dick had the option of putting John Bow into that car, Mike. Uh, John, far more experienced in the Sierra than uh, Paul Radisic, and uh, has the benefit of a smaller backside than Dick. <laughs> I'm not going to answer that. I'm not going to touch that with a barge pole. Coming down Conrod Strait. I tell you, there has it's almost Arctic conditions outside at the moment. So my uh, lap scorers tell me, sitting out in the balcony, our backup support to race score. Stand by, folks. We've got one heck of a race to go to the flag here today at Mount Panorama Bathurst, the Tui's 1000 1990 edition. Alan Grice carries our Dulux Auto Colour race cam and he will lead away from Paul Radisic, Larry Perkins and Peter Brock. We're going back to racing. Pace car into the pits. Time to get the hammer down and get back and see where we're going for 161 laps. Only 29, I think, or so left. So, it'll be Alan Grice in the number 16 car. Clear of the number 18 car. Let's pick them up as they exit. Hill Corner make their way up Mountain Straight. The charge now as they try and pull out. Here's one forcing the pace, trying to get out and race, and that's uh, Gricey in the number 16 car heading up to uh, the right-hander at Ripco Corner. Some great pitches there from our race cam to the right-hander now. Conditions in which Alan Grice revels, just loves this sort of tight, hard racing. He's got to worry about the weather, he's got to worry about the car, he's got to worry about fuel. And he's only got a few laps which to do it all. As when Percy said fuel is going to be critical. Probably right. would have loved the pace car to stay out a couple of more laps, Mike. Yeah. Conserve, we've got red lights on at the top of the mountain. All the cars with a lot of, on the brakes there, I saw them uh, disappearing into uh, Skyline. Put something had happened there, right, let's pick them up as they drop down into the S's. Grice goes through. Looking for the gap back to Paul Radisic. Now to Forest Elbow. It's very, very slippery there. That's where the Graham Callahan car went in. Looking to uh, see that gap back to Paul Radisic in the 18 car. The visual split. Dreissig isn't uh, hanging about at all as he comes howling down here into uh, Caltex Chase. The suggestion that some hydraulic oil from the tow truck that went to pick up the, uh, the strand of Brian Callahan Barry Graham car on Forest Elbow has made conditions uh, very, very slippery indeed at, uh, at Toledo Tools Turn. There's certainly a, a little bit of liquid down there. May have come from the crashed car. I don't hear the fat lady yodeling, but what a fantastic job and what a turn up for the books it'll be if a Commodore gets up to date. The Sierras had the numbers, they had the horsepower, they had the form, and yet we have a couple of Commodores in the top three, something that very few people would have predicted a few days ago. These guys up front will be running on adrenaline, but uh, it's been a tough six hours, and they're into their second or third or fourth stint. And 
concentration levels have they have to be maintained and the guys will be having a suck on a on their water bottle just to uh, prevent dehydration everybody has their own means of keeping their concentration well Alan Grice has certainly got to keep his I don't think there's any problem about that Alan can sniff a victory he's a professional race car driver and uh, he knows what it's like to win here let's check them out for you on the Caltex race score confirming that Alan Grice and Wynn Percy in car number 16, the Holden Commodore, continue to lead the Alam and Radisic, Shell Sierra, third Perkins of Missouri and another Commodore. Brock and Rouse are fourth in the 05 Mobile One Sierra, fifth Neil Crompton, Bradley Jones in the Holden Team Commodore. Sixth place, Kevin Waldock and Michael Preston, they're going very well. From position number 79, Hansford and Needsfitz running in 838 Bagnall and Francovic. Ninth is, of course, Bill O'Brien, Brian Sampson and the Everlast Commodore. And rounding out the 10, car number 10, Klaus Nietzschwitz and Frankie Biela in the ANZ Sierra. Don't go away. Got a feeling something's about to happen. Yes, Mike, you're right. It seemed to all happen in the last hour, didn't it? It seems to be accelerating as we look into these wins update time by time. The first one is Alan Bryce, race cam shot here. The number 16 car has been one of the front runners all the way. The win, Percy Allen Grice. Win started the day driving. Allen's in the car at the moment and hoping to bring it home for a victory. In the pits here. The biggest decision was when I stood in the pits with one more stint to go, with a pulsating shoulder, taking painkillers, thinking, we stand a chance of winning this. I'm not the man to do this. Alan, would you like to stay in the car? That was the biggest thing I've done in probably in my racing life, making that decision. Because that was that was pretty difficult. But the manager's hat said, you've got to do that. The driver's hat said, my God, you're giving away this chance. The Holden fans going wild on top of the mountain. They've been pretty quiet in virtual hibernation for the last three or four years. The Commodore, initially in Group A regulations, as the years went by, became less and less a competitive proposition. But the Holden Racing Team, and full credit to them, have put an enormous amount of development working on this car. And it has been right on the pace all day. Fantastic effort. Once again to Forest Elbow. Right's coming up, I believe it could well be the Chris Lambton car. As he heads down under the GO bridge, bound for Caltex Chase, the right hand king coming up shortly. Bryce is flashing his lights at the slower car, that's the Landon Crick skyline, shoots past him. Bryce is really on the boil. Great to see for Alan, but of course he was instrumental in the search for a champion that uh, received, I believe, a little unfair flack this week. Um, with a lot of other drivers supporting Alan to try and get uh, some budding races to Bathurst to drive in their own car, they achieved that. But I guess to uh, to make the qualifying cut in anything like this, you have to show potential. The bottom line to that whole argument, I guess, Mike, is that what Alan has done, regardless of all the controversy, is he's just done a fantastic thing for Australian motorsport. There's no controversy, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, Bryce, Johnny Smith, Jimmy Richards, everyone else got behind the scheme because they wanted to uh, develop some new Australian talent. If you haven't got the talent, stop whinging about it. Heading up to the right-hander. Another one of the Toyota Corollas there being passed by Gricey. Yeah, he's certainly a guy with plenty of talent. When he came over to Europe with the Commodore, I, uh, I think he fairly shocked most of the European teams. That uh, gap, still 14 to 14 and a half seconds. It's going to be the longest 14 or 13 and a half laps for Alan Grice at Bathurst. And a lot uh, hinging on this, I would think that uh, the Holden uh, race team, Wynn Percy and all the guys, Bradley Jones, they've put together a, a class act at uh, Bathurst. And with a new car uh, coming online for a season 91, a more competitive car, that's great to see uh, Holden back and uh, winning. And this is a circuit that certainly suits a Holden Commodore. 
They don't come much better than this guy, Alan Grice. He's been racing since the late 60s. He's got a number of firsts to his credit. First guy to lap this circuit at 100 mile an hour lap average back in 82. And he's also the first Australian to qualify for a Grand National NASCAR race in the United States. He certainly likes to spread his driving ability around in a number of different cars. And he's still one of the quickest guys out there. Well, the great race continues. Let's check them out on our Caltech race score. Gricey and Wynn Percy showing the field. No mercy here today. Alam and Radisic run in second. Perkins and Mazira third. Commodores one and three. Peter Brock runs in fourth place in the Mobile One Sierra. Fifth, yet another Commodore, Neil Crompton and young Bradley Jones. Sixth, 28, Kevin Waldock and Michael Preston. Great effort there. Seventh, 38, Bagnall and Francovic from New Zealand. Great effort. Running eighth, Bill O'Brien and Sampson in the Commodore. Ninth, Needsvitz and Biela. And rounding out the 10 now, they've come into it. Chris Lambden and Greg Crick. That's a great effort also. Well, the drama's still to unfold. Back in a sec. Drama is certainly alive as we wind down to the final 11 laps or so of the great race. Working up to uh, lap 150. They've broken the twoies out at the top of the mountain. These Holden fans have waited a long time for this and uh, they can smell a victory in the air. The atmosphere up there is going to be electric over these last 10 laps. The gap is still constant, about uh, 15 seconds. And the gap between second and third, about 52 seconds. So, at the moment, Grice in the number 16 dealer team car, leading from Paul Radisic and Dick Johnson's number 18 Chelsea, and Larry Perkins then running in third place. Peter Brock is fourth. Well, I'm not taking anything away from Paul Radisic. He's a good operator, but Dick Johnson will be sitting there in the pits, wishing his legs were about one foot shorter, I'd say, at this stage. Would have been great to be out there chasing Grice on his own. Grice coming down behind Brian Callahan Jr. Mobile concrete pumping uh, Commodore. Floats it wide into the turn. Every lap looks exactly the same. He's a professional businessman at work. The workplace yep. happens to be a driver's seat. This is Grice's office. He's comfortable with it. As we take Dulux Auto Color race cam. Gricey, can you bring it home from here? Yeah, I think so, Mike. Car's very good. Just got a snick on third gear. Um, but the car's very good, so it's looking good. What a return, eh, mate? Yeah, that's a certainty. <laughs> you don't show much emotion, but we'll do, talk about that a little later on. Maybe about another 13 laps, or another uh, 10 laps, I should say. Yeah, I haven't hit the clock yet, mate. I'm still at work. Yeah, I, sorry about that. I'll let you bundy off. Yeah, not a problem. OK, thanks for the chat. We'll talk to you maybe the final lap. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Alan. I think you can get a good idea in this, Mike, of the sheer aggression that he's driving with this car. He's absolutely wringing its neck. Um, it's as hard as you'll ever see any Commodore go around here. And uh, the, the other thing with Gricey, that he doesn't expend a lot of personal energy driving the car. He's so neat and tidy the way he goes about the business. You don't see arms waving everywhere. He's very short and sharp in the gear changes. He just uses the right amount of energy to get the job done. He's lapping to 19.5, uh, 2198, lap after lap. Ten laps to go for Alan Grice. I reckon no, 219 is going to be too hard for Paul. Uh, I, I honestly feel that Paul's going to actually drift back a little bit. As good as uh, Dick's cars are and everything, it's, it's a very hard job to get a young guy that's fresh from overseas coming that's not used to driving Sierras and throw him up the mountain like this and get him to, to, uh, to pull back 14 second deficit in 10 laps. It's just too hard. And what a credit to Holden too, providing Alan Grice with the machinery to do his work. It's a production-based engine. It's unbelievable the revs they can get out of this thing all day. It's a production-based motor car, and uh, it's a fantastic effort that they can get this thing so competitive and to run at the head of the field for most of the day. Yeah, that's right, and I think, you know, full credit to Wayne Percy, who, who runs the team with Wally Story's engineer. Wally's been such a, a good operator. He's come from Sydney. Wynn drafted him out of his own business, like uh, more engineering in Sydney, and uh, took Wally down to, to Melbourne, set up the show, and... And they've run these cars all year, and they've absolutely run their neck all year. 8,000 revs, I said earlier. A lot of revs to use in a big V8 for 1,000 k's. He comes across the top of Nissan Skyline. 
we've monitored uh, uh, that split for the last five laps. It has been very constant. 15 to drop down to 14 seconds at one stage. Gricey picked up the extra second the next lap. Once again out of uh, Toledo Tools turn. Is the Pearson Stewart car. Heading down Conrod Strait. Well, I guess a guy must uh, feel very, very happy at the moment. That's probably uh, the greatest understatement of today is Wynn Percy. Wynn can hear us in the pits, that right, Wynn? Yes, I can hear you. Just speak up a little bit. Would you like to talk to your driver and bring in all of our viewers to the little conversation? Take it away. Okay, mate. Can you hear me, Gracie? Yes, Wynn, I got you. You're doing a grand job, buddy. I can't quite believe it. I know there is, buddy. There's 11 to go. We're just keeping our fingers crossed for you, but it looks pretty good. OK, I'm sort of trying to keep that gap at the moment, keep the revs down as well. We've certainly got enough fuel uh, to get home, but Wally just wants to make sure, so I brought both revs down to 7.2, as you can see, and uh, that'll save us a lot of, uh, lot of fuel. So I, I guess we'll get, get in a way heavy there, Win. For an old guy, you're doing pretty well, mate. I tell you what, this team manager's job's worse than ever driving a motor car. <laughs> Keep it up, buddy. I'll see you soon. I go, Win. Thank you, Win. Thank you, Alan. So Gricey heads up to BP Cutting. We've been riding around with him so you can follow his style, just how smooth he is. Track very, very greasy. You can see a lot of the feedback through the wheel. This car doesn't run power steering. They run manual steering on it. And the, uh, with the big 10-inch tyres on the front, it really does fight the drive. It's an incredibly heavy car to drive through the steering. But once you sort of get it up on top of the springs and everything, it's working like that. And I think with the amount of drilling that's going through Gricey at the moment, it wouldn't matter if it's a 10-ton truck, you'd be driving <laughs> it the same way. I think you're right somehow. Jeez, he's driving it down the hill here, back through to third, back to second around the hill. He was a jump off the top. Into third now. Come on, Smithy, talk us around a lap and with Gricey. He's told it to be back to back to second for the Forest Elbow. Turn it in. Car, well, it's, geez, it's still slippery there because the car was understeering out wide. He's in third, fourth. You can hear the gears screaming. So way down the chute now. through the kink without a lift on a little lift off not really breaking that hard pulling it back from about 290 k's down through the gears to back to second you can bang through the gears the straight cut gears tend to scream and moan a lot i suppose they, they all do <laughs> back to the third back to second turn it in now for pit straight just misses the curve on the curve on the exit just holding on to it he's, he's saying he's using seven two now he's pulled it back from eight just to try and save some fuel Back to third, back to second again. Back up to Mountain Strait. It's a pretty quick lap with Gricey. Thanks to our Dunlop race cam now, we take it out of the front bumper, John. Yeah. It's sort of like a hang right out the front of the car. The cars tend to lift off and fly over both humps coming up and down the mountain. It's back to third. We should be third through here. The car drops off the actually the circuit drops off camber just there we run over the camera and uh, it gets very taily and light. Just a dab in the brakes and then back to second again for the cutting here. In close to the wall and out wide. See the seven helicopter following that around there. Geez, he's really using all the road. A few drops of rain appearing on the screen there. I was going to tell you, even if Paul did catch up to him somewhere, he'd have hell's problem trying to get past him. Yeah. <laughs> I reckon Grice could make a car about 20 feet wide if he wants to. Ah. The, the better halves have joined us, Mrs. Percy and Mrs. Grice. Should smile, girls. It's not that long to go. Can't see their hands in that shot, but I'd say every finger would be crossed. Yes, I'd say Christine Grice would be riding this one with Alan. This would mean so much to them. The second Bathurst victory. You can recall the, uh, his last one was with uh, Graham Bailey 
in the chickadee chicken car and again he was uh, he was magnificent on that day so rosemary percy and uh, christine grice hang fire in the pits waiting to see what happens the lead held by uh, alan grice as we wind into the final stages of the race to his turn at the top of the mountain it just it might just go the the uh, traffic might be holding grice up a little bit too mike uh, yeah, you, you do you can drop two seconds very quickly on one lap just by getting uh, catching a slow car at the wrong spot as i said a bit earlier it's uh, it's one thing to catch him it'd be a hell of a different thing to pass him well grice you could also be backing off a little bit here the only concern in the hrt team at this stage is the fuel situation grice he's knocked the revs back to 7200 but that's still quite marginal. So he mentioned in that conversation with Wynn that he was trying to do... Uh, he thought that he had enough fuel to uh, to go the distance, but they're preparing a churn down there just on the off chance. Yeah. Could be a very late stop here just for a fuel. Yes, Mike, it's going to be borderline, there's no doubt about it. Uh, as you're aware, Alan has uh, backed off a little bit on RPM to save or conserve fuel. The guys here are a little bit worried that uh, he may have to come in. Uh, we won't know for a few laps, it's just going to be so close. But, I mean, Alan will be on the mountain or somewhere around the circuit. It gives one cough, he'll have to come in. Gee, that is close, isn't it? Yeah. again to uh, Forest Elbow. We're full and the class leading uh, Toyota heads down the Conrad Strait. Yeah, well, Grice, he's certainly dropped his revs. It's an audible difference. You can hear he's dropped them right down. So he's obviously aware of the fuel situation and uh, he's trying to stretch at every last drop at this stage. As Pete McKay said earlier on, we still haven't heard not even the slightest yodel from the fat lady, so we... I reckon it's, it's not over till it's over. <laughs> OK, this time past, we will have five laps to go on the great race. Has Grice got enough fuel to go the distance? Radisic is still closing. runs back in third place. Peter Brock is fourth. Still approximately the same gap there. You can see it. So they go beneath the Corolla hot hatch sign. Here comes Alan Grice. He goes through. Look for the Red Sierra. And there he here is. it comes past Jeff Fall. There's not much in it, is there? Uh, I was going to say, gee whiz. It looks like it's getting closer all the time. Gricey, out of Toledo Tools turn. Next time around, three to go. One smoking across there to the left. Looks like the Bagnall Francivic car. Alan Grice, so close, yet so far. Second to third, that's uh, of course Paul Radisich to Larry Perkins. One minute 16, no race there at the moment. Larry conserving to finish third. Hopefully to give Commodore and Holden a 1-3 in this. Here he comes. We're riding with him. Riveting stuff. Three laps to go for Alan Grice. It would be just criminal if it ran out of fuel there. <laughs> Absolutely criminal. on the way up the mountain for the third last time. You can see in the background there's the Red Sierra just, just coming onto the straight. So they're the length of mountain straight apart. Well, Commodore's still standing sweet. No he's problems at this stage. He's working it hard, just like lock of a break as he's going in, just the merest hint of uh, 
a brake lock up. It's working at hard. I think what we, we might be looking at a fuel stop coming up, John, because if he's putting in lap times like this, maybe he's trying to make the biggest brake he can on Radisic before he ducks in for just one churn of fuel. Wouldn't matter, mate. Uh, 14 seconds, forget it. It's all over. Yeah. Um, yeah, by the time you, you pitted and got out again, Paul could have drive past in first gear and do it. Yeah. Holden's first, third and fifth. His best result for uh, Holden's for a long, long time. Even when um, Brocky got up in 87, uh, you know, it was sort of a Clayton's victory because the, all the kudos went to the Fords. It took nine months to win it. That's right. Two laps to go, win Percy. Oh, the feeling for win. And also uh, a great result for their sponsors, uh, Castrol and uh, Telecom. They've stuck with the team. They've been uh, slim pickings against the Sierras on the short tracks. Um, but there is some fairness, I guess. This car's come, uh, come good absolutely at the right time. It's, it's amazing how it all works, isn't it? You, you chip away and chip away until finally you've got a really good race package, and that's what this has been today. 14.66 seconds, the gap back to Paul Radisic of New Zealand. Coming across the skyline, down towards Castrol. A lap and a half to go. Have you got enough gas, Al? Yeah, we're looking pretty good, Mike. Anyway, it's a bit expensive to buy up here on top of the mountain. Yes, the, the crew looked a little nervous with the churn out there. Everybody's nervous with 11 and a half to go, mate. I've got the revs back. We certainly, um, we've done this number of laps before today. And I'm actually running less, less revs, as you can see. So, um, I'm not sure we'll make it. supporters are having a wonderful day. Yeah, there'll be a few Holden boys that all change us tomorrow, perhaps. I don't know if this thing really needs to go in for service. I tell you, you give Wynn, Percy, Cardick a rest if you pull into the pits and then keep going. <laughs> no, I don't think they'll put it in for service. It's only done a thousand k's. I think there's a nice sign coming up for you here now. What does it say? It's a nice little sign. You want to talk us through it, Alan? Yeah, not a problem. This has been a problem all day, the little cars, but by and large, they've been very good. How did the, uh, my uh, Peter Jackson search for champion boys go today, Mike? They dropped out, uh, Alan, but... Uh... I thought did a great job and as I've said earlier I thought it was a, a great project involving not only yourself but guys like Johnny Smith and Jim Richards who all came along to try and discover Australian talent. Yeah, I'm very, happy. I'm very proud of them. They, uh, they put himself on the, the grid of the biggest race in Australia and they got 20 cars behind them. I thought, boy, I did the right thing. I picked the right guys. I'm sure you did. I tell you what, look at the Holden fans out here on the right as you come across the top of Skyline. You can probably hear the applause from here. I can. There's some happy boys and sick heads up here. Got time to give them a wave? Oh, they do that. Fans on top of the mountain, here he comes. I love the Commodores. Oh, look at them. You made their day. He's put oil all over the road there. I only just saw it. I was a bit busy looking at the crowd. But there's oil all over the road back there. Bradley, uh, watch out for that. Oil all the way down the mountain. A little slippery out of there too. Yes. Uh, oh, well, whoever's laying the oil, if they're doing it on the last lap, I hope they're making it home. It's been great to ride with you and win Percy with our seven Dulux Auto Colour race cam, Alan. Coming down to the final corner, checkered flag time, crowd absolutely.
absolutely berserk. Last turn, checkered flag. How does it feel? To his champ, Alan Grice. It's uh, the best feeling I've had since 1986, i got to tell you. <laughs> well done, son. You've driven superbly. Thanks, Mike. I guess that answers a few critics, and I guess it puts uh, Holden back with a very strong challenger with a new car for 1991. Yes, uh, if we can just uh, run on the right fuel for everybody next year without all the Manhattan cocktails, we'll have a wonderful year of motor racing. Well, there's marvellous scenes down here in the pits. Win Percy, Chris is there, Roseberry. Team managers, I think all the Holden people are delighted as well. So Christine giving Wally Story a big kiss for that one. I think he's done a lot of work for that car. The top, top. Alan, I'll let you uh, go back to the pits, and I'm sure that Bruce McAvaney and our audience will look forward to seeing you on the balcony for the presentation. Well done, champ. Alan Grice, the winner of the 1990 Tui's 1000 here at Mount Panorama Bathurst. Paul Radisic chased superbly. 15 seconds, the gap at the finish of 161 laps. Larry Perkins makes it a great day for Holden. He finishes back in third. Fourth place, Peter Brock, King of the Mountain. Tried all day after problems with tyres early in the race. Fifth place, of course, going to uh, Neil Crompton and uh, Bradley Jones in yet another Commodore. So it's a great day for Commodore. Yeah, there's Wynn Percy, Wally Story. What a fantastic... Dick Johnson, first guy to shake his hand. What a fantastic effort by the Holden Racing Team. Not too many people tip this, but uh, what a great result. They ran at the front of the field the whole day. The car never missed a beat, apart from a minor clutch problem, which didn't slow them down. And they brought the thing across the line. The, the, line. the lion has roared again at the mountain. I've never seen a more popular victory than that. I think everybody in the pit lane would have wished them well. John Crennan there from uh, Holden, walking down with uh, Wynn Percy there. Yes, a great day for them, and the fans are already running down to the presentation area. I believe this is probably the most competitive uh, two is 1000s that's ever been, with the uh, level of uh, professionalism with all the teams that have been here, and yet um, here it is, good old Aussie Commodores pulled it off again. All the drama, the suspense, the high attrition rate, the lead changes. It's been a fantastic Tui's 1000. Well, there's Wynn Percy heading down Victory Lane. Heading towards the presentation uh, area where he'll join uh, his winning co-driver today, Alan Grice. I think Wynn and Alan might be with us. Wynn Percy's about to come out with Alan Grice, one of the... Uh, Great victories in the history of Bathurst. And if we can just extricate Wynn Percy, the team manager, and Alan Grice, who did a lot of the driving today. Grice, who was successful in 1986. So who are we waiting for? Alan Grice and Wynn Percy. And we're still just waiting for a moment. Second to the shell. Racing team of Dick Johnson, Paul Radisic, and Jeff Allen. And third was Larry Perkins. But, uh, I think we're just about ready for Wynn Percy and Alan Grice. And the Minister for Sport in New South Wales, Bob Rowland-Smith, will present the Tui's 1000 trophy to the winning team, the Holden dealer team of Percy and Grice. So we'll just get Wynn's uh, attention in a moment. Win, if you'd like to accept the trophy, then we're watching it. It weighs a bloody ton. It does weigh a ton. Win, if you'd like to put that down for a shout to the crowd, I think you and uh, Alan. Come forward, Gricey. And Win, congratulations. And firstly to you, uh, did you ever think you'd be driving for the official Holden dealer team and winning here at Bathurst? You ought to know me, I never give up hope. <laughs> Must have been very sweet today. Yes, it was. Uh, this is the nicest day I've had since 86. Um, but it was an absolute privilege to drive the motor car. It was so strong. I think no, no, no necessity for a thousand kilometre service. Win as a team manager, it must give you an extra special thrill. Well, 
I can't quite believe it. It's pretty good for a whole new team. But uh, when I asked Alan to drive, I really did know that I was taking the best Australian driver here at Bathurst. So between us, we've done it. I'm really proud of it. Well, Gricey Wins just described you as the best Australian driver at Bathurst. You must feel like that right now. He's, he's very biased. <laughs> Some celebration tonight? Oh, yes, plenty of that. For sure. <laughs> well, the Commodore's back in town. What do we look forward to next year? Win with the new Commodore. Well, the VN's going to be quicker. Uh, it's a slippery motor car, so I reckon we'll be back to do it again. And what about Bryce? Do you think he might be on the team next year? Suits me fine. Alan, would you like to be there? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> of course. OK, a big cheer for Alan Grice and Wynn Percy, the champions. And I think we're about to have the obligatory champagne shower. Grice, he reckons it won't come off. Celebrations here at Bathurst, as you'd expect, with a Commodore back in town. Percy and Grice successful, and still the celebration goes on. <laughs> a great catch there, and uh, well, they can fight for that one. So you got Brock in a what is it, Sierra? So, so what's that say to you? We had to go that way if you want to win a race. You had to have a turbo. You had to do it. Yeah. yeah but you didn't. No, but uh, the reason we won that race was it was the early stage of racing the turbos over a thousand kilometres, particularly on a circuit that has such a rise in al al altitude. Right. And uh, we knew that uh, although the turbo boost was supposed to be fixed, uh, it wasn't. They had controllable boost. And uh, we figured that um, they do what they always had started to do, and that is they put the boost up, run away, and then wind the boost back, and just settle down and run the car conservatively for the rest of the day. And we planned that um, if we absolutely hammered our thing, and you, we used every last hundred revs all day, and the latest braking markers all day, if we um, made them get back on and wind their boost up again that we we thought they'd run into real liability problems and it was a good guess they did but you could see it if you watch the race carefully that uh, they would run away and then they'd wind the boost back and think they could have a spell for the rest of the day and then we'd catch them and get right onto them and they'd wind the boost up and off they go again but we finished up we hammered them to death <laughs> 